Israel could be potential targets. It's a small country as it is. Now, hectic diplomacy is underway to avoid what is increasingly becoming inevitable, a wider war in West Asia. America is trying to pull Iran back from the brink. The U.S. Secretary of State has been making calls, asking the likes of China, Turkey and Saudi Arabia to stop Iran. But will they be able to convince Tehran? And remember, this escalation started with Israel. They're the ones who carried out an airstrike in Syria. They bombed an Iranian consulate in Damascus. Top military officials, top Iranian military officials died in that strike. Iran says Israel's strike was a direct attack on them. So now they want to pay back in kind. How would they do it? Most likely using medium-range missiles. That's one of the probable scenarios. They're already issuing threats online. Videos have appeared showing simulated attacks on Israel. They feature high-value targets like Israel's high fire airport and a nuclear facility in Dimona. Israel is said to have a nuclear reactor there in Dimona. So the plans are very much in place. Iranian officials are now waiting for a go-ahead from Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, the supreme leader of the country. Reports say he wants to think this through, carefully consider all available options, the political risks of an attack and the potential backlash, backlash from Israel. About which Netanyahu is leaving no doubts. He says if Israel is attacked, he will respond. We established a simple principle. Whoever hurts us, we hurt him. We are preparing to meet the security needs of the state of Israel, both in defense and in attack. Yesterday, Israel conducted an operation in Lebanon. Israeli jets were dispatched. They struck at least five targets. Israel says they took out Hezbollah infrastructure. In fact, since the beginning of the Gaza war, Israel has been fighting the Hezbollah on its northern border. This is an Iranian proxy group. So far, this fighting has led to the deaths of over 300 people in Lebanon and 18 people in Israel. The security situation is rapidly deteriorating. America and its Western allies do not have much time. They have a narrow window to convince Iran and stop a major attack which could consume the entire region. But then again, America's options are also limited. It cannot communicate with Tehran directly. American law bans U.S. diplomats from engaging with Iran. So they have to go through intermediaries like the Europeans. In this case, Germany has delivered messages to Tehran. In these times, Nobody should add fuel to the fire now. No one can have any interest in a conflagration with completely unforeseeable consequences. All the players in the region are called upon to act responsibly and exercise restraint. With this in mind, I also spoke to my Iranian counterpart today. West Asian powers are also calling Tehran. In the last 48 hours, Saudi Arabia, Iran, the UAE and Qatar have all dialed Tehran. They've spoken to Iran's foreign minister. It is not clear what they discussed or how effective these efforts have been. So far, there's been no change in Iran's posture. And the U.S. is preparing for the worst case scenario. That is an Iranian strike. Washington has sent a message to all American officials in Israel and their families. They've been asked to stay in Tel Aviv, Greater Jerusalem or Beersheba areas. European countries have issued travel advisories for Iran. Yesterday, Lufthansa cancelled flights to Tehran and this ban has now been extended till tomorrow. The situation remains precarious. The region, anyway, was a powder keg and the Gaza war has lit the fuse. So tensions between regional rivals are exploding. Six months ago, when Israeli troops launched their offensive, it put the entire region on the edge. A swift operation could have reduced tensions, but Israel has shown no willingness to end this war. There have been a series of diplomatic initiatives, but they've all failed to deliver a breakthrough. So even if Iran is persuaded to stand down this time, the risk of a wider war in West Asia still very much remains, and it will remain until the war in Gaza ends. Needless to say, an escalation would hurt the whole world. So cooler heads must prevail. From West Asia, let's turn to the other conflict zone, the Indo-Pacific. China is on a mission to dominate this region, but the U.S. is fighting back. It is building alliances to contain Beijing. You have the Quad, you have the AUKUS, and now you have a new triad, the U.S., Japan, and the Philippines. Their first trilateral summit was held on Thursday. Joe Biden hosted his two counterparts at the White House, Fumio Kishida of Japan and Ferdinand Marcos Jr. of the Philippines. Both nations, Japan and the Philippines, are treaty allies of the U.S. So on paper, Washington must defend them if attacked. But that commitment has always been questioned. Would the U.S. really go to war for Manila? Or for Tokyo, for that matter? 
Well, on Thursday, Biden set the record straight. He promised to defend both nations. And I want to be clear, the United States, the United States defense commitments to Japan and to the Philippines are ironclad. They're ironclad. As I've said before, any attack on Philippine aircraft, vessels, or armed forces in the South China Sea would invoke our mutual defense treaty. That's a very strong statement, especially in the current context. You see, China and the Philippines have maritime disputes. Both claim parts of the South China Sea. Often this has led to standoffs, like Chinese Coast Guard ships firing water jets at Filipino vessels, or ships colliding with each other, or Chinese vessels cutting across Philippine ones. We have seen multiple incidents in the last few months. In that context, Biden's statement is quite important. Plus, it's a political shift for Manila. Marcos' predecessor was Rodrigo Duterte, and he had a very different policy on China. Duterte was closer to China, but Marcos has dumped that policy. He is openly pro-America. He has visited China once as president, but he has visited the United States four times. That's four visits in less than two years. So clearly, Marcos has picked a side, and he says this alliance is not about convenience. It is about rule of law. It is a partnership born, not or of expediency but as a natural progression of a deepening relation and robust cooperation amongst our three countries, linked by a profound respect for democracy, good governance, and the rule of law. We've seen such groups before, but what they've lacked is political will. Many of them could not even name China in joint statements. So what could they achieve? Is this triad any different? For starters, they've named China. Listen to the joint statement that has come in. And this is what it says. We express our serious concerns about the People's Republic of China's dangerous and aggressive behavior in the South China Sea. We steadfastly oppose the dangerous and coercive use of Coast Guard and maritime militia vessels in the South China Sea. Well, that's a good start. It signals that there is political will to take on China and to name China, especially in Manila. They have a lot more at stake here. The Philippines is closer to China than the U.S. It's a much smaller economy and its military is much weaker. Yet Manila is standing up to China and it has not been intimidated by Beijing's aggression. This week we saw an example of that. The Philippines took part in a military drill in the South China Sea. Japan, Australia and the US were also involved. It was the first joint drill by these four countries. So Biden likes what he's seeing. He has found a reliable ally to contain Beijing. The question is, how will China see this? They have condemned such groupings in the past. This time, they have called it hegemonic behavior. Some countries outside the region led by the United States are constantly cobbling together small groupings in the South China Sea, provoking confrontation in the name of cooperation, showing muscle in the name of peace, and creating chaos in the name of order. This is typical hegemonic behavior. So China is not happy. And most of their anger is against Manila, which raises an important question. Why is Marcos making this pivot? Why is he risking so much to court the U.S.? There are two major reasons for that. One is public opinion. Look at what a survey found in 2022. 89% Filipinos said that they trusted the U.S. Only 33% trusted China. And this was before Chinese ships harassed Manila. So chances are these numbers would have fallen even more. The trust in China. Reason number two is material gains. Duterte bet on China for more investments, but that did not happen. Between 2016 and 2022, Beijing invested $1.7 billion in the Philippines. Compare that to other Southeast Asian nations. In 2023 alone, China invested more than $8 billion in Vietnam. So the bet never worked. And that's where the U.S. came in. Biden was quick to woo Marcos when he became president. He was the first foreign leader to speak to him. He's also promised a lot of money. Manila has big hopes from this triad. It is expecting $100 billion in investment from Japan and the U.S. The only problem seems to be trade. China is still Manila's biggest trading partner. The U.S. is at the second position. But Marcos doesn't seem to care. His position on China is rallying many countries, even India. In 2022, New Delhi sold the Brahmos missile to Manila. Last month, Foreign Minister Jay Shankar visited the country. He was in the Philippines. He backed Manila's position in the South China Sea. 
So the Philippines is emerging as a key player, but it also puts them on the front line. And we've heard American presidents make tall promises before, only to cut and run when crisis came. It's something President Marcos should be mindful of. On to the Maldives now. Looks like President Mohamed Moizu's anti-India rhetoric is backfiring. This time on tourism. You may remember the boycott Maldives trend. Moizu's ministers insulted India and Prime Minister Modi. So many Indians said, we won't visit the Maldives. And guess what? They're actually doing it. So Maldivian tourism agencies are worried. One of them held talks with India's High Commissioner in Mali. It's called Matato, Maldives Association of Travel Agents and Tour Operators. After the meeting, they announced a plan. A plan to bring back Indian tourists. The first step is holding roadshows. Key Indian cities will be selected. Then roadshows will be held to promote Maldivian tourism. The second step is using social media. Travel influencers are a big deal nowadays, so maybe the plan is to get them on board. But why the desperation? Because the boycott trend is working. Let's look at the numbers. Last year, almost 1.7 million tourists visited the Maldives. Indians were number one on this list. More than 200,000 of them visited the island, more than 200,000 Indians. But this year, it has changed. India has fallen to number six. More than 660,000 people have visited the Maldives. Only 37,000 of them were Indians. And who's leading the list? China, with 70,000 tourists. So Indians are turning away from the Maldives, and this is bad news for them. India is much closer than China or Russia or Europe. The flights are cheaper and the culture is similar. So Indians should be a reliable source of tourism for the Maldives. Their economy, the GDP, also 60% of their foreign earnings. So if tourism falls, the Maldives suffers, which is why travel agents are worried. The question is, can a roadshow fix all of this? Well, India did not start the diplomatic face-off. President Moizu did. Yet New Delhi has not abandoned the Maldives. Last week, India made a gesture of faith. It increased export quotas on essential goods. Basically, India promised to send more goods to the Maldives. A 5% increase in eggs, onion, sugar, rice and wheat flour. That's a 25% rise in river sand. And this last one is very important. River sand. Because no sand, no infrastructure, no bridges, no buildings, no roads. The Maldivian foreign minister also thanked India for this gesture. Another outreach came from Prime Minister Modi. He greeted President Muizu on Eid. He also highlighted the cultural and civilizational ties. So India is doing everything it can. The rest is up to Muizu. In January, he called India a bully. He also asked Indian soldiers to leave the country. Now Muizu says it's all about sovereignty. Yet the same Muizu has signed new military deals with China. But he forgot a basic rule of geopolitics. You see, you can change your allies, you can change your rivals, but you cannot change your neighbors. Geography is the only constant in geopolitics. And we are seeing evidence of that now. First in the rising export quotas, then in the tourism sector. Tourism is a major job provider in the Maldives. It employs more than 50,000 people, which is almost 10% of their population. And Muizu knows all of this. Recently, he appeared to tone down his rhetoric. He called India his closest ally. But words alone will not be enough. Soon have a chance to judge him. Because parliamentary elections are slated for the 21st of this month, 21st April, Muizu is looking to secure a majority in parliament. Chances are his India policy will be on the ballot. If he wins big, expect him to lean more on India out. If not, there could be a rethink. Now let's talk about the American economy. There are fresh fears of a recession there. America's fight against inflation has stalled, and that's raising concerns here in India as well. So what really is happening? Let me explain. Since last year, the U.S. Federal Reserve has been on a mission. It's also called the Fed. This is the Central Bank of America, the Federal Reserve or the Fed. Now they've been trying to cool the American economy and contain the high inflation. So far, the Fed has not made any meaningful progress. Fresh data came out this week. Prices of many essentials are still high. Americans are still shelling out more money for refueling their cars, for buying homes, dining out and buying clothes. And that is not good news for the Federal Reserve. So it has resolved to keep fighting. Recent readings on both job gains and inflation have come in higher than expected. Reducing rates too soon or too much could result in a reversal of the progress we've seen on inflation. 
So the Fed won't be cutting interest rates. And this has had a trickle-down effect. The European Central Bank has followed suit. The Governing Council decided today to keep the three key ECB interest rates unchanged. The incoming information has broadly confirmed our previous assessment of the medium-term inflation outlook. India's Reserve Bank is doing the same. Earlier this month, the RBI reviewed its interest rates. And just like the US and Europe, the RBI, the Indian Central Bank, also kept the rates unchanged. In January and February, inflation in India hovered around 5%. The RBI's target is to bring it down to about 4%. But just like in the United States, in India too, they're facing challenges. In its recent review, the RBI identified oil prices, geopolitical tensions, and volatility in financial markets as potential risks as the problem areas. India's top banker Uday Kota gave his own assessment. He says the Fed's decision, the American Central Bank's decision, combined with rising oil prices the world over and China's lack of growth are all troubling signs. In his opinion, interest rates will remain high in India. And everyone should, and I'm quoting, get ready for global turbulence. Now, inflation still remains a worry for central banks. If inflation remains high, central banks typically use interest rates to contain prices of goods. What they do is they make loans more expensive. When the cost of borrowing is high, when a loan is more expensive, people and businesses will spend less money. That's what usually happens. When interest rates are high, buying homes and cars becomes expensive and businesses refrain from expansion. So overall, this has a cooling effect on the economy. Since People are buying less and factories are churning out fewer goods. But there's also a catch here. If interest rates are kept high for too long, it could slow down the entire economy. People may start to spend less and save more. Businesses may start incurring losses due to a decline in orders, and this might force them to cut jobs. So an extreme of either is problematic, and central banks have to walk a fine line. But if inflation remains as stubborn as it is right now, they don't really have a choice. Central banks may be forced to keep interest rates steady. Or worse, they could hike them again. And that is what is worrying economists in the U.S. They think the Fed may induce a recession just to bring inflation under control. If this happens, the overall confidence in the global economy may shift because growth depends on not just policies. It also depends on the general sentiment among business owners, among investors, stock markets, even among common people. If everyone starts feeling it, if everyone starts feeling that there is a recession, it tends to reflect in the numbers. America's extended battle against inflation does not inspire confidence. In Europe, a peace summit is being organized, a summit to end the war in Ukraine. And who's hosting it? Switzerland. Now, this summit was first proposed by President Zelensky. He asked Switzerland to plan it. And since then, we've heard a lot about it. The potential, the participation, the proposals, everything except a date. But now we have it. We have a date. Switzerland says the summit will be held over two days, June 15th and 16th. And who will attend? The guest list has not been finalized yet, but more than 100 countries have been invited. Reports say it's a high-level engagement meaning heads of state have been invited to attend, your prime ministers and presidents. A Swiss newspaper claims Joe Biden will be attending, but the White House has not confirmed it yet. Interestingly, the G7 summit is also around the same time. Italy is hosting the G7 leaders between June 13th and 15th. So chances are Biden will already be in Europe. India too has been invited by Switzerland. In February, the Swiss foreign minister traveled to India. In March, Zelensky spoke to Prime Minister Modi and then Ukraine's foreign minister visited New Delhi. All of this had the same goal, to get India on board. Prime Minister Modi could be in Europe around this time. Since 2019, he's been invited to every single G7 summit. But the question is, will India attend this summit, the one in Switzerland? We haven't heard anything from the government yet, but chances are New Delhi will be wary, especially because Russia may not attend. That's right. Switzerland says they want Russia there, but Vladimir Putin is calling this summit a circus. The idea of holding some kind of conference in Switzerland is being pushed. We are not invited there. 
Moreover, they believe that we have nothing to do there. But at the same time, they say that without us, it is impossible to decide anything. And since we are not going there, this is already a complete circus. Two questions. A. Why isn't Russia attending? And B. What's the point then? What's the point of this meeting? Moscow says Switzerland is not neutral anymore. The Swiss have already sanctioned Russia. Plus, they're coordinating closely with Zelensky. This whole summit is based on his proposals. And what are those? What are those proposals? There are 10 points in total, but these are the important ones. Russia must withdraw its soldiers. Russia must give up the annexed land. And Russian soldiers, Russian leaders rather, must be dragged to court. These are all non-starters for Moscow. So Moscow is pushing its own plan. An aborted peace deal from 2022, Putin has said that Russia and Ukraine were close to a deal that year in 2022. Again, the proposal has a lot of points, but these are the important ones. Ukraine will not join NATO. Ukraine will reduce the size of its military and eastern Ukraine will get more autonomy. Now, in public, Zelensky has rejected all of this, which brings us to the second question. What is the point of this summit then? Well, diplomacy must always be given a chance. That's what they say. So no summit can be declared pointless completely. Also, Switzerland is aware of the challenge ahead. They're not expecting a peace deal in June. They believe another summit will be needed to achieve that. This is the first step in the process for lasting peace in Ukraine. We are not going to sign the peace plan at this conference. There will be, we think, a second conference, but we want to start the process with this conference. Do not underestimate Switzerland. They specialize in such negotiations. We've seen that across many conflicts in Syria, in Colombia, in Palestine, in Iran and in Azerbaijan. So they have a history of getting stuff done, but the Swiss alone cannot succeed. They need both sides to make concessions, which is why more than 100 countries have been invited. More countries equals more pressure. And some of these countries are Russian partners like India and China. The hope is that these countries can force Putin to make some concessions, to dilute some of his demands. Of course, that works both ways. You can expect a very strong Western contingent at this summit. They will need to counsel Zelensky to make him climb down from some of his demands. If not, it doesn't matter how many summits you organize, the result will be the same. Our next story is about modern warfare, or rather, warfare in the near future. For a while now, drones have taken over the battlefield. There are the heavy, lift, the heavy hitters, like the American MQ-9 Reaper or the Turkish TB-2 Bayraktar. These have been around for a while, but now we're seeing smaller drones dominate the arena, like the infamous Iranian Shahids. These are relatively cheap, one-time-use drones, and they've been used to devastating effect in Ukraine. So countries are scrambling to come up with an effective counter. And it seems the world is turning to laser weapons for that. Israel has its iron beam. The U.S. has a laser called the Helios. Even India is building one. It's dubbed the Durga 2 project. And now the U.K. is rushing forward in this laser race with its new weapon, the Dragon Fire. Here's our report. Drone warfare has barely taken off. But are its days already numbered? Because there's a new defense system on the way. A system that'll bring kamikaze drones down in the middle of their final flight. We're talking about anti-drone lasers. Now the technology has been around for a while, but they used to be considered impractical for warfare. Laser weapons cannot incinerate your enemies. They can't melt a hole through an approaching tank. Best case scenario, they melt a thin metal casing and overheat some sensors. At millions of dollars per laser, that isn't the biggest bang for your buck. So then why are laser weapons everywhere these days? The most famous is arguably Israel's iron beam. The laser's intensity can reach 100 kilowatts. It has a range of about 7 kilometers. Then there's the US. The American Army has the Directed Energy Maneuver Short-Range Air Defense System, 
shortened as the Day M. Shorad, not the catchiest of names. But the American Navy remedies that. Their laser weapon is called the Helios, which stands for High Energy Laser with Integrated Optical Dazzler and Surveillance. These are 50 kilowatt prototypes that are already being deployed for field testing. The British have the Dragonfire. And today, Britain's Defence Secretary Grant Shapps made an announcement. The Dragonfire is going to be tested in the field next month by the British Navy and the Army. The UK has also brought forward the expected date of deployment. Shapps said it'll now be by 2027 at the latest, five years ahead of the original rollout date. Does that mean Britain has perfected their so-called world-leading laser weapon? No. Shap says there's a new defence procurement process. The goal is no longer to get it to 99.9% .9 ready and then deploy. Shap said the UK plans to get it to sort of 70% and then get it out there and then develop it from there. So it'll be perfected in the field. But if it won't be ready, why the rush? Well, because of the enormous potential benefits and the cost saving. These anti-drone lasers are expensive to develop, but once they're installed, they are cheap to use. Apparently, one laser shot from the Dragonfire costs £10, about $13. Compare that to the anti-aircraft missiles being used to blow up drones. Shap says a single missile costs about one and a half million pounds, almost two million USD. It's the same situation in the US, with each standard missile too used by the US Navy costing two million dollars. Now, this still makes sense for your Predators or Bayraktars, but not against a kamikaze drone like the Iranian Shahed-136. It's about $200,000 to buy one of these from Iran, and between $20,000 to $50,000 to make it yourself. Some of these kamikaze drones. But the anti-drone lasers will turn the tables. $13 versus even a $20,000 drone is a steal. The lasers even come out on top against homemade drones. Like the $300 drones Ukraine has developed to fight Russia. So anti-drone lasers could change the face of warfare yet again. That's the reason for the laser scramble. To protect both your skies and your budget. the Rameshwaram blast case, we are now learning uh, that there's been a major breakthrough after NIA detained the key suspects. There's another update that the main accused has now been arrested from West Bengal. This is the big breaking story that we are bringing to you with regards to the Rameshwaram blast case. Remember the NIA had identified Musavvir Hussain Shazib as the key accused who had carried out that blast at the cafe. Uh, the Rameshwaram Cafe in Bengaluru on 1st of March. Those are the CCTV images of uh, the main accused. Let's quickly go across to Arunima who is currently live with us. Arunima, uh, share with us uh, details of this arrest that's just been made. How has the NIA finally been able to trace him all the way to Bengal? So what the NIA has said is that they had concrete leads. They were questioning all the ISIS uh, Shimoga module members for some time now. And based on that, they got a, a lead that uh, perhaps there is a hideout or somebody who's harboring the accused in West Bengal, based on which a team landed up at their hideout in West Bengal early this morning. And they found both the main accused, uh, Muzaf, Muz, uh, Musavvir Hussain Shazib, who's accused of placing the IED at the Rameshwaram Cafe Blast. He's the man you see wearing the baseball cap in all the CCTV footage that was captured by NIA. And his harbourer, Abdul Mateen Taha, the alleged mastermind, as the NIA is calling him, mm. he allegedly planned this entire conspiracy, put together the explosives for the IED and trained Shazib to carry out this uh, blast. So the, both of them were together uh, and they were found at this hideout in West Bengal early this morning by NIA. They will be taken uh, to the relevant court in Bengaluru. NIA is likely to seek custody from there.
Absolutely. That's in fact uh, a huge shot in the arm for the NIA. On that note, let's also go across to Harish who's live with us. Uh, Harish, major victory for the NIA now that they've been able to trace the accused and the co-conspirator. Uh, this would have been a multi-pronged investigation, I believe. Absolutely. NIA pointing out that uh, they have indeed received uh, help from multiple agencies, not mm. just Karnataka police, but police uh, in other states as well. As Arunama pointed out, uh, this has been an investigation that's uh, uh, gone into several states. It was in Tamil Nadu for a brief while in Maharashtra because there was a suspicion that they had gone to Pune. Now they've been picked up uh, from uh, West Bengal. In the meanwhile, there were other states uh, in North India where they had a bit of a suspicion. That too has been looked into. It also gives an indication on how uh, the planning has happened. Now let's talk about artificial intelligence. It's the dawn of the AI age. Every day new models are being launched and that has led to a scramble for talent. Companies are poaching top researchers, million dollar packages are on the table and big perks are being offered. So AI jobs are booming. But what about the rest? What about your job for instance? Is it AI proof? It seems Bill Gates has the answer. He has listed three jobs that are safe from artificial intelligence. Our next report tells you what they are. The world of artificial intelligence. It's no stranger to drama and right now there's plenty of it. Take OpenAI for example. It's fired two top researchers. Apparently they had leaked information outside the company. It's not clear what sort of information they had or who they leaked it to. But it seems OpenAI took the offence quite seriously. So now they've been sacked. It tells you how serious the AI race is. Every day there are new products and new innovations. Yet the people producing them are still a handful. Top AI talent are almost like a Pokemon, hard to find and impossible to catch, which is why companies guard their talent fiercely. Take Tesla for example. Their AI engineers are getting a salary bump. It's not because of record profits. Tesla sales have in fact dropped. It's because OpenAI wants these engineers. Elon Musk has himself talked about it. He says the talent war for AI is the craziest talent war he has ever seen. And it's truly getting crazy out there. Candidates are being offered eye-watering salaries. Those are being matched with salary hikes. Then there are other perks like stocks and free travel. Everything is on the table when it comes to poaching talent. And when that doesn't work, tech CEOs are adding a personal touch. Reports say Mark Zuckerberg has reached out to AI researchers in Google. In fact, he has written them personal emails. The Meta CEO even offered them jobs without interviews. Then there's Google co-founder Sergey Brin. He apparently had to call an employee who was leaving Google for OpenAI. Brin had to personally convince them to stay, including promises of more perks. It tells you how limited AI talent is. But while AI jobs are in demand, what about other jobs? Is artificial intelligence going to replace them? AI could impact 300 million jobs. That's about 9.1% of all jobs in the world. According to the IMF, 60% of all jobs will be affected by AI in some way by 2025. So artificial intelligence is coming for your job. Which brings us to the question. Is your job AI proof? Bill Gates was asked this. He says there are only three jobs that will be immune to artificial intelligence. These are energy related jobs, biology related positions and professionals who design AI tools themselves. According to the Microsoft founder, only these three jobs won't be affected by AI. The only ones where humans will not be replaceable. So does that mean your job is in danger? Well, artificial intelligence will change the job market like any new technology has in the past. Some jobs will become redundant, but it will also give birth to new jobs. We just don't know what it will look like yet. But one thing is for sure, AI will reshape the world of employment in the years to come. 
coup in 2021. On the other side, you have the rebels, armed militias from various ethnic groups. Now, these rebels have been pushing the military back for months, and yesterday they achieved another major victory. They ousted the junta from the town of Mayawadi, near the border with Thailand. The junta has confirmed that it has withdrawn its troops. But the situation is still tense. Residents are fleeing the town. They're making their way across the border into Thailand, which has sent alarm bells ringing in Bangkok. Here's our report. Today, you will see that the army has deployed forces to hold fort along the borderlines. We are keeping a close watch so that there is no fighting spilling into our sovereignty. That was Thailand's foreign minister. He made that statement earlier today while he was in the border town of Mae Sot in northwestern Thailand. A river flows at the edge of town, and that marks the Thailand-Myanmar border. Across the river lies Miawadi, the latest town to slip from the Myanmar junta's grasp. Myanmar has been under junta control since February 2021, and for over three years the junta has tried to consolidate its rule, stamping out resistance with brute force. But a few months ago, the people had had enough. On October 27th last year, three armed groups launched a rebellion. And soon it spread to every corner of Myanmar. The country is full of different ethnic groups, divided among the various states. One of these groups are the Karen. They have also joined the rebel alliance. And it is a Karen armed group, the Karen National Liberation Army, that has captured Miawadi. Their political wing, the Karen National Union, put up these pictures in the last few hours. One of them shows a haul of weapons they've captured from the junta. Other pictures show the junta forces, taking refuge near a bridge. That is the bridge that connects Myanmar to Thailand, Miawadi to Mesot. It is now at the centre of the action. Junta forces are taking refuge there, knowing the rebels won't attack them because of the Thai troops nearby. As Thailand's foreign minister pointed out, Bangkok has ramped up troop presence on its side of the border. Heavily armed Thai troops are patrolling the area to ensure that violence doesn't spill over. And their presence is also why people are fleeing towards Thailand. The junta has been driven out of Miawadi, but they have sent reinforcements to try and take it back because the town is critical to the economy. Miawadi is the gateway for land-based trade between Thailand and Myanmar. 2023 saw $4 billion in overland trade between the two countries. $1 billion worth went through Miawadi, so the junta will do everything possible to recapture it. Now that their troops are out, they may resort to aerial bombardments, which is what the locals fear. That is why they're leaving. Thailand also doesn't want any airstrikes, which is why it mobilized its fighter jets on Wednesday. The Thai jets were patrolling their airspace as a warning to Myanmar's junta. Thailand wants the fighting to end. They're already getting flooded with refugees. It was about 4,000 people every day this week. Thailand will soon reach its limit, which is why it's pushing for peace and warning against an escalation. Maybe it's a time to reach out and make a deal. And maybe that's, the, that's probably the time so that they can realize that maybe the wise decision can be made uh, having the people of Myanmar at heart. But will Myanmar's junta listen? We'll find out in the coming days. Our next story is about Gen Z, those born between the late 1990s and the early 2010s. Understanding this generation is a newfound hobby for many. And so far, three words describe Gen Z the best. Woke, broke, and baffling. Especially when it comes to personal finance. Tonight, we'll discuss why. Gen Z has thin wallets, but expensive tastes. They're open to splurging, not just on buzzy restaurants or travel destinations, but even in relatively humble categories like grocery shopping. In fact, groceries have reportedly become one of the top spending priorities for the young. But there's a twist here. Gen Z is spending more on high-quality products like fancy beverages or expensive protein bars. So it's less about shopping for food, hunting for little treats.
But this is not the only way Gen Z treats itself. The young are also driving the sales of luxury goods. Their luxury spending is growing three times faster compared to other generations. By 2030, the young will account for 80% of global luxury purchases. Is this because the young suddenly have a lot of money? Well, no. Experts say it's because of doom spending. Usually when people are on shaky ground economically, they spend lesser. That's what common logic says. If you don't have enough money or if you don't know about your future, you spend less. But Gen Z is doing the very opposite. They believe the financial future is doomed anyway. And they're less concerned about traditional milestones like home ownership or a life with kids. Instead, they're going for big ticket purchases. And this is what surveys say. 50% of Indian shoppers are, quote unquote, living in the now. We're talking about the young. 68% of them are Gen Z urban males. In the US, 27% people admit to doom spending. The number is even higher for Gen Z. So Gen Z is buying the so-called little luxuries, like expensive skin care or bags, and taking the treat yourself motto to a whole new level. It sounds like a dream because doom spending gives instant gratification, but this comes with some long-term damage. It is a counterintuitive spending habit. It can work as a self-fulfilling prophecy. It increases the risk of living from paycheck to paycheck. And this is obviously a fatal financial mistake. But in the moment, it seems reasonable thanks to the parallel universe that Gen Z lives in. I'm talking about social media. It is littered with images of young people splashing out on a glamorous life with lavish meals, vacations, designer shoes, even overly priced water bottles. And the victims of social media suffer from FOMO or the fear of missing out. So they want it all, and they want it now. According to global surveys, 60% of Gen Z admits to impulse shopping because of social media, and this is followed by instant regret. But when it comes to personal finance, that's the only regrettable role of social media here. Young people are turning to social platforms for financial advice. 41% reportedly say it is their first choice. And why is that? Because social media is changing the language of money with trends like loud budgeting and cash stuffing. It is making financial literacy fun. Secondly, it's keeping up with the need of the hour. The tax filing season has begun in many countries, and this is a stressful period for everyone, I think, especially for the young, though, who are relatively new to what they call adulting. To many, there is nothing scarier than filing. Brought 54% of Gen Z to tears, and 25% say they need a therapist to deal with tax filing stress. So how are they coping? With TikTok, believe it or not, self-acclaimed financial experts with close to no credentials are sharing tips on taxes and, and how to save money. And millions of people are getting influenced by such dubious advice. So for all the young out there, if you're worried about personal finance, it is great to seek advice. Financial literacy is of utmost importance. It is a life skill especially as this subject gets bungled by most education systems the world over. But just because social media is quirky and easy as a source, it doesn't mean it is the best. Our last story is about cancer. It is a leading, leading cause of death in the world. In 2023, cancer killed nearly 10 million people. That's over 26,000 deaths every single day. Yet we have no single cure. Now, scientists are exploring new treatments like microbots. These are tiny robots. They're about the same size as human cells, and they're made from seaweed. They can be controlled wirelessly. These bots will navigate through the cell network, target individual cancer cells, and help prepare them. So could microbots help treat cancer? Our next report tells you. Cancer, a six-letter word that can scare even the bravest. Humans have made all sorts of advances, space travel, artificial intelligence. But if there's something that we haven't found, it's a cure for cancer. Cancer is the second leading cause of death globally after heart disease. 10 million people die every year from cancer. Yet we have no cure. That's because cancer isn't just one disease. It's a group of over 200 diseases. Cancer can start in any part of the body. It happens when there are changes in a group of normal cells. Cancer cells have gene mutations. These may be inherited or may develop over time.
cancer cells don't behave like normal cells. Our cells grow and die, but cancer cells grow and divide out of control. That leads to uncontrolled growth. Scientists have now found a new way to tackle these cancer cells. It's microbots. They are about half the width of a human hair, so about the same size as cells. These tiny bots are made of seaweed. Millions of them can be produced in just minutes. Also, they can be controlled wirelessly. So scientists can navigate how they move, and then they are used to communicate with cells. When we point the laser in the direction of the robot, we can see that it starts to move. And so, we can then move it within the cell clusters, and move it to other locations, and then look at several cells in different ways. The microbots aren't ready to help cancer patients just yet, but it could in the near future. The plan is very simple. Scientists will use these bots to target cell clusters. They will understand how cancer cells work. These microbots will then reach them and in the end help repair these cells. We're, we're using these microbots to build um, tissues under synthetic conditions. And the whole point of this is to, in the future, then repair um, damaged tissue or organs um, at a really patient basis. So if I can sort of like, you know, manufacturing cars in a um, robotic uh, factory, I'm sort of imagining our micro-robots really picking um, and placing very specific types of cells in a very specific type of um, architecture so that um, we can really tailor that tissue to the patient's needs. Humans have poured billions into cancer research. We have chemotherapy. It's the use of toxic chemicals to kill cancer cells. But it often leaves cancer patients weak. For years, scientists have had one question. How do you treat cancer without killing normal cells? These microbots could solve that problem. They could target just the cancer cells, leaving the normal ones healthy. At this point, the research is in the nascent stage. But scientists believe it could be a game changer in the future. On the Rameshwaram glass case, we are now learning uh, that there's been a major breakthrough after NIA detained the key suspects. There's another update that the main accused has now been arrested from West Bengal. This is the big breaking story that we are bringing to you with regards to the Rameshwaram blast case. Remember, the NIA had identified Musavvir Hussain Shazib as the key accused who had carried out that blast at the cafe. Uh, the Rameshwaram Cafe in Bengaluru on 1st of March. Those are the CC, CCTV images of uh, the main accused. Let's quickly go across to Arunima who is currently live with us. Arunima, uh, share with us uh, details of this arrest that's just been made. How has the NIA finally been able to trace him all the way to Bengal? So what the NIA has said is that they had concrete leads. They were questioning all the ISIS uh, Shimoga module members for some time now. And based on that, they got a, a lead that uh, perhaps there is a hideout or somebody who's harboring the accused in West Bengal, based on which a team landed up at their hideout in West Bengal early this morning. And they found both the main accused, uh, Muzaf, Muz, uh, Musavvir Hussain Shazib, who's accused of placing the IED at the Rameshwaram Cafe Blast. He's the man you see wearing the baseball cap in all the CCTV footage that was captured by NIA. And his harborer, Abdul Mateen Taha, the alleged mastermind, as the NIA is calling him, mm. he allegedly planned this entire conspiracy, put together the explosives for the IED and trained Shazib to carry out this uh, blast. So the, both of them were together uh, and they were found at this hideout in West Bengal early this morning by NIA. They will be taken uh, to the relevant court in Bengaluru and I is likely to seek custody from there. Absolutely. That's in fact uh, a huge shot in the arm for the NIA. On that note, let's also go across to Harish who's live with us. Uh, Harish, major victory for the NIA now that they've been able to trace the accused and the co-controlled investigation, I believe. Absolutely. And I pointing out that uh, they have indeed received uh, help from multiple agencies, not mm. just Kanatka police, but police uh, in other states as well. As Arunama pointed out, uh, this has been an investigation that's uh, 
uh, gone into several states. It was in Tamil Nadu for a brief while in Maharashtra because there was a suspicion that they had gone to Pune. Now they've been picked up uh, from uh, West Bengal. In the mean. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. In Gaza, citizens build a tent for, from empty food cans to symbolize life during the war. In Florida, police rescue people stranded in floodwaters after a severe storm. And in America's National Hockey League, a shot aimed for goal went over the net, smashing a TV camera instead. Finally, we're taking you back in history. On this day in 1961, Yuri Gagarin became the first human in space. He orbited the Earth in a Soviet space capsule. The 27-year-old cosmonaut became an international celebrity. He died just years later in a jet crash. We're leaving you on that note. Thanks for watching. Have a great weekend. AC for Smart Homes in association with Ashok Leyland. Koi manzil dur nahi. Welcome everyone. Thanks a lot for staying with us. You're watching Plain Speak with me, Shivani Gupta. India's anti-terror agency NIA has made a big breakthrough arresting the alleged mastermind and the bomber of Bengaluru's Rameswaram Cafe Blast. The NIA apprehended Musavvir Hussain Shaziv, the key accused who allegedly placed the IED at the cafe and Abdul Mateen Taha, the alleged mastermind behind the planning and execution of the blast. The two are residents of Titahalli area in Karnataka's Shivamoga district but they were arrested from West Bengal, where they were hiding under false names. This success came after a dozen searches, over a dozen searches really, at 18 locations in Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, UP. And coordinated action and cooperation between the NIA, Central Intelligence Agencies, State Polices of West Bengal, Telangana, Karnataka and Kerala. While this once again shows the commendable work our agencies are doing, the fact that these terror accused settled in Bengal post the blast has become a big political debate. BJP has accused the TMC and the Bengal government of being soft on terrorists, which is why the accused they contend run and hide there. The TMC of course is furious at the suggestion, hitting back at how the state acted promptly in arresting these two individuals. So is there any truth in the charge that terror suspects find it easy in Bengal or can the TMC effectively rebut the safe haven claim? We'll get you more on that in just a bit and we'll take that big question to our guests as we go along. 
Now, both the arrested accused are residents of Titahali in Shivamoga district, as I mentioned. They have managed to travel across states clearly before reaching Diga in West Bengal from where they were arrested. Let me just break down what we know about these two individuals. Now, Abdul Ma uh, Ma Ma Mateen Taha is the mastermind allegedly behind the planning, execution of the blast and the 